I'm going to teach, or not teach you, but tell you about uh, his life story and what we taught him during the, the years that we could work with Dirk. It's very hard to follow on Victoria, I must be honest. <laughs> I must be honest, because just as a mother with an autistic child that presented autism, that presented deafness, hard of hearing, that presented aphasia. Uh, many years later now, Victoria, after your, what you told us about the vestibular, I can now tell you that there was many points of the vestibular missing in their case system. Now, it's just got a clear picture for me now. So it, it's really nice to actually have heard that so many years later. So now it makes sense. Okay, so let me just start for where we started with Durkee. Durkee was born on the 23rd of December 1987. I was 30 weeks in my pregnancy, but I had preeclampsia. So from going to a monthly checkup with a doctor, gynecologist, within two hours I was in hospital and preeclampsia. So he wanted to do, see whether we can stick to 32 weeks, because I was 30 weeks. Let's just keep him till 32 weeks of pregnancy and see if we can go there. Well, it didn't last. That same day, 11 o'clock at night on the 23rd, Dirty was born with emergency C-section. And within 36 hours, I presented three times hemorrhaging that I had to go back into theatre. So... It was life-threatening for me as well as for him because he was obviously very early and very small. He was intubated and ventilated immediately. He weighed 1.1 kilos. He was head circumference of 35 centimeters, which immediately told you there was a problem because the head should not be that big. His length was 48 centimeters and he was immediately on 30% oxygen. So Dirkie was there with a lot of symptoms that happened at birth, the trauma at birth. But the preeclampsia that I had, which is kidney failure, high blood pressure, and all those symptoms, just made the situation for him much worse than it was supposed to be at that age for him. The symptoms that came with Dirkie, that's not his scan, that is just a picture of his scan, uh, of, a, of a scan. The symptoms that came with Dirkie at birth is that he had grade 3 enlarged ventricles on the brain, which is not a good thing because that meant hemorrhaging on the brain. He had sternal retraction, which means it's respiratory distress. Obviously, can't breathe, needs oxygen, needs all the help that he can get. He had a neonatal ulcer and he had inflammatory jaundice. So at one point in time, the, uh, the pediatrician said, you know, sometimes in little with premature babies like this, you know you have this or that or that that goes wrong. Unfortunately, I must tell you, and he called you my little man, my little man's case, this and this and this and this is going wrong. So I have no high hopes for him, but we're going to fight. The symptoms carried on. He had haline membrane on the lungs disease. He had patent ductus arteriosus, which means that the pipes in the heart, the blood, the oxygenated blood, and the, the dirty blood, like we called it, and the healthy blood, they were mixing, so that had to be fixed. So he had a heart operation when he was eight days old. He was bradycardia, which means he forgot to breathe. So he just stopped breathing. He had to sleep on his apnea mattress. Then he, couldn't, then he said, oh, you know what, I'm one in a million, so let me sort of get the cytomegalovirus and see what I can do with that one. Just put it on. Now the cytomegalovirus, you must know as a layman or a young mother, my first child, my only child, um, you don't know what is going on. And the doctor, if he talks to you, you want to know exactly what, what's happening to your child. And he explained to us that the cytomegalovirus is something that will happen, can happen normally with babies, and it's there, but it's not so good when it happens to him at this age and at this stage, because he's so small. Because the, the virus can affect all of his organs, then or later in life. So you don't know. Could he have eye damage? Could he have ear damage? Could he have 
other organs that were affected, or could it happen late in life that you can say, okay, it actually goes back to the cytomegalovirus that he could have picked up. Then he also had two, two, not one, two congenital inguinal hernias for which he had to be operated on. On the day that he was supposed to be born, he had two hernia ops. By that time, then he was nine weeks old already. At home, when we took him home, it became very clear to us that his growth was definitely delayed, that there was a problem, that we had to look at him and say, where to from this? What do we have to do with this? New mother, I fortunately had a good support system in our parents that supported us with him. We saw the development is not at the ages where children would be for that specific age because he was so premature. The brain function, we could see there was definitely something wrong. So now you start with a world where you think, where to from here? Where do I find help, uh, guidance? Where do I get help? Who's going to tell me what to do? Your mom has three children, so at least she can give you a guideline. But it's not enough because we were all three normal and we were creeping and crawling and did all the stuff that we're supposed to do. So she can guide me in a way, but there was definitely more than what we needed. At six months, Dippy could still not roll over. At seven months, we decided that there is definitely something wrong with his ears and we had hearing tests done. He had a 70% hearing loss. We gave him hearing aids because that was the obvious solution. He only responded to low frequency at 45 decibel, which was very low. You had to really scream very loud, very low. People actually over the years said to me, my voice changed. It was much higher. I actually started talking much lower. Although he couldn't hear us, we still kept on talking to him normally. High frequency could not be measured. He could not be measured. There was no high frequency hearing. The sound at 45 decibel was 20 decibel above normal speaking tone, which meant that he could not hear us at all. So the mid-ear infections, the otitis media that he had, was so severe that the mid-ear, when they did the tests in the ears, they just said it's severely impaired. There's nothing that they can do with that. So the hearing aids at a point in time became something that was not working. He had it, but it was not really helping him. At language, at 12 months, there was no language. He had a few sounds that he made, but there was no clear words. There was no um, collection of any sentences or words or mama or papa or whatever. Those words were non-existent in his life. I think that he decided after he was born that let's just carry this on. You know, I've done everything so far, so let's just do the next step. So we went to the doctor one day and he said, oh, I think Dirk has got cerebral palsy. Really? Why? He said, you know, because he's scissoring his legs. He's not kicking like a normal baby. He's scissoring. He said, okay. He said, well, let's see what we can do. But if he will ever walk, it will be with great difficulty. We left the doctor's rooms and on our way home, my husband said to me, scissor. What did he mean by scissor? <laughs> I said, you know what, he meant that his legs are not straight. His legs are crossing, so that's not a good thing. He says, okay, then we must stop him scissoring. <laughs> okay? Project. Project, here you come. We're going to stop him scissoring. So we've gone home and we sat down and we gave my parents what the doctor said, that he's scissoring, he might, be, he might have cerebral palsy, so we don't know. Okay, so we're not going to wait and see if it happens. We're going to make sure that it's not happening. So my dad built us a T-block. A little piece of wood. It's a block like this. And we put it in between his legs. And every time he lay down, if he kicked, he kicked against this block. So he could not scissor. We forced him. 
he cannot scissor. He just kicked and went straight. Kicked and went straight. I must say that looking back, I think that was one of the first brightest ideas that we ever had because we created new pathways in his brain, like the half brain that's gone. We created that root in his brain to say, you can fire the synapses, the neurons in different ways, and you can create a new pathway. So we forced him not to be able to sit up. We forced a new way for him to be able to walk, or to creep and to crawl and to walk. At 19 months, he walked. Very wobbly and very uncoordinated, but he walked. And that was one of the first major milestones in his life. Then starts the other problems. Eye contact. No eye contact. Dirty was such a good baby. People used to say, he's such a good baby. He never cries. He never, he's very happy. He keeps himself busy. Um, he doesn't, you know, you can just leave him. That was red flags to us, because a baby should not be good. There should be different things that he should do, different things that he, he must be able to see in the environment, different things that attract his attention, different things that keep him going. So we started looking at why is the eye contact like that? The concentration is not good. There's different stuff that we need to do with this child. The environmental challenges, he didn't go up and look for different things to do. We said, no, this is different. We need to get some therapies. So we did the normal auditory therapy, speech therapy, physiotherapy, occupational therapy. You, you, you start off with the stuff that you know you can get help from. We went to Dr. De Villiers at the Union Hospital, and she said, OK, let's do an EEG and see where we can go from here. Let's see if we can identify something. It came back with a left parietal post-temporal and right frontal damage. So it said to us, there is damage in the areas of Wernicke and Rocca, which is the language center in the brain. And if you looked at the left parietal post-temporal uh, damage that was in the brain, it was his self-perception. Dirty had no self-perception. He didn't know. It's like Melody was saying they, they start with their neck to their feet. He didn't know that. He didn't have a self-perception of himself. The sensory acuity that he was supposed to have, there was nothing. Learned movement. Her words to us was, if whatever you, you will know in life, you will have to teach him. Okay. That's a good challenge. We'll have to teach him. Location awareness. He had no way of knowing where he was. Spatial, no way to know where he was. The right frontal is the loss of movement, which came back to the paralysis type of things, to the cerebral palsy. Now, when we read, and, sh and she said to us, this is aphasia, called expressive aphasia, uh, because that is like Victoria was saying, they name or label certain areas in the brain, and then they say, this is what's wrong with the child. Now, when we looked at the aphasia handbook for adults and children, we found that Dirkie actually had receptive expressive aphasia. He could understand when we talked to him with language, our language, sign language that we used, but he could not give it back to us. So he, if I said come, he would come, but he would never turn around, look at me and say come. He couldn't do that. So he had receptive and expressive. So if we looked at Dirty in terms of what he was doing, it was very difficult to communicate with him because now he had no sound. Thinking back, when we took the hearing aids away, he still couldn't hear. He couldn't hear better with them or worse. Thinking back, because of the hearing aids that weren't there and that area of the damage, it was the vestibular not getting the connection to the brain. So it's actually brain deafness and not ear deafness that he had. So we started off with the St. Breville Centre for Child Development in the UK on a program for physical stimulation. They used the Bowman de la Carta program, which looked at intellectual stimulation, physical and physiological. So if we look at those, the intellectual, we used 
therapies like talking with touch, um, auditory stimulation, and uh, lots of drawing. His physical stimulation was creeping and crawling. We literally took him back to leopard crawling and to creeping to create those cross pattern in the brain. We literally took him back. On a table, three people, one with his head, arms and legs, and we literally repatterned him. And lots of vestibular exercises. Now I know why. But lots of vestibular exercises. Walking with him backwards, eyes moving sideways, moving him like this. We didn't want to use the, the autistic tendencies of rocking. If, if he rocked, for instance, we would make him tumble. <laughs> physiological, <laughs> physiological, we looked at nutrition, the metamorphic technique, and a lot of reflexology. Like Victoria was saying, massage, even massage can help. Lots of different stuff can actually help a child. The Otitis media was a real problem because he had like 13 sets of hearing aids in six years, uh, hearing ear tubes in his ears. The hearing aids was there, but it didn't work. And the language that we started with him was the Makaton, which is a very basic sign language. Because he couldn't understand language, you could not teach him vocals, consonants, and all that. So we used the Makaton, come, eat, toilet, drive. So it's very basic. The autism spectrum, or presentation of autism, those characteristics were there. Poor concentration, no eye contact, didn't smile back at you when you smile at him, couldn't say his name, didn't listen to you, ignored the world around him. The good boy was not a good thing, but we decided that if everybody tells us he's a good boy, we would say yes, because remember, look what he can do. He's a good boy, and then we would clap our hands. So Dirk became very, very proud when we clapped our hands because it meant he was a good boy. He was getting somewhere, he was doing something. And on top of that, he had Pika. I don't know if you know Pika, but he stopped where they were at the age of three when they eat grass and sand. Okay, Dirk <coughs> had Pika, but with metal. He ate screws, thumbnails, electrical wire, pins, needles, but he swallowed it as well. The repacking that we did helped a lot, and as I say, with his rocking, we made him tumble. And the talking with touch on his body helped a lot. That's the massaging, the one-on-one, -on -one, because remember the trauma of birth? taken away immediately in an incubator, ventilated, that body on body was not there. So the talking with touch is that exactly that. We actually slept naked with him in the middle between me and my husband for almost three, four years, just to get that back. The stimulations that we followed were sensory, obviously, leopard crawling, creeping, auditory, flashcards, gross motor, smell and taste, and drooling, we use ice and spoons and different cloths and soft brushes and that type of stuff. Um, I need to tell you that the Doma de la Carta program takes about eight hours a day of stimulation. Then, my life changed. <laughs> <laughs> then I met Melody in mind moves. This was learning through natural movement. It was worked on energy. It gave us a mind-to-muscle program. It was a language opportunity. Can you imagine that mind moves was a language opportunity for us? Because we were playing with him, and because we were working with him, and we did it in a natural way, but there was the mind-to-muscle or the muscle energy talking that I could do. We created our own language. Suddenly I could talk to him because I could say yes and no, and Dirty, and Dirty was so good, he was like, <laughs> you want to ask a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I would ask my question. So we created our own language. He would, he would sit in a restaurant and give me his arm because he knows I'm going to read through the, the menu <laughs> and go, okay, then he eats this. Okay, and I will order that. So it became a language to us. We did the embryo rock, the elephant, the cross crawls. We had different names for all of those things. Remember, this is now a few years back. 
but the mind moves was natural, which meant that we could do this now at home, we could travel and do it, we could go anywhere and still do it. It was not bound to specifically go to see people, have him stimulated and do it. It was something that we took with us all the time, wherever we went. We could go camp and we could still do these, these play activities because it's natural learning. We decided very early on in life, because he can't hear, we cannot show him, uh, tell him about the world, so we have to show him. So we travelled with him extensively. And it, that, it was an adapt or die situation. Because the worst part of the whole situation of a child that presents itself with any learning disability is that the environment does not adapt to them. They have to adapt to the environment. So we try so far as possible to expose Dirkie to anything and everything. Any normal day, everyday interactions. Going to church, he had to learn. You sit still. You have to sit still. Going to a restaurant. Going to a shopping mall. Look, I must be honest with you, there were plenty times when he was much bigger than me, older, he would dive under the shelves trying to look for a screw and I would die with him. <laughs> because once he'd take me and then I'd have to get him out. Because you can get to a stage where you go with a child that is comfortable and you live with him. Not that he did that often. He was reprimanded, but it is the natural instinct to do it. But we exposed him to that. Dirkie had his own school at home where my mom sat with him every day and she started using the drawing techniques, the, all the simulation that we used to do, she started drawing with him. And then we started taking his own drawings and color it in. And at a certain point in time, she said that she saw that, you know, some of these pictures are really nice. And we started coloring it in and we started playing with it and we used it and just happened that at a point in time we went to a, a South African artist did me a quarter, and he said, you know, there is some art movement in this child's hands. The pictures are not the normal stick person's drawings or the round body. It's nothing like that. It's just something different. We went to Karin Prello, who's still, day, still a, a South African artist that does photo real art. She said, yeah, I see something in this. We took him to the University of Bethlehem. They evaluated him. And they said, you know, the hand movement of this child is like a 20-year-old. At that point, he was 13. He, they said, we can classify this as line calligraphy art because he only draws with a pen, black, blue, or red. This is Dirkie's people. This is how he used to draw people. 2015, we got another diagnosis. Dirkie had testicular cancer. The cancer was removed surgically and they couldn't give him a chemo because of the level of sedation that he would need for that to work. The doctor said there's no way that they could actually do it. So we just prayed and hoped that everything was cut out, which it was. And it happened that it went over. 2019, we started this range of the clothing range. The range that you see over there on the table, which is the mugs, that's just some examples. It's the mugs and the earrings and all of that. We started that in 2010 already. And we call Dirkie's business mind prints because he's printing his mind. He can't tell us what he's printing, but you can see. Sometimes it's a flower or it's a bee or it, whatever it was. So we started this little business for him and we're selling it as mind prints. 26th of June 2021, unfortunately, Dirkie passed away due to a heart attack in his sleep. I want to thank you for Dirkie's life, but what was his achievement? He crept and crawled a thousand meters a day at the height of his simulation program. He walked at 19 months. He was potty trained at five, but he was potty trained. He dressed himself. He used the toilet without help, except for number two. He laid the tables. He hung washing on the line. He unpacked the dishwasher. 
he helped make his bed. He traveled like a pro. He adapted to all situations like church, camping, flying, hiking. He learned himself to use a tablet. He downloaded his own games. Not free. <laughs> <laughs> he built puzzles on his tablet and he socialized with many other people in his own way. I think in the main way through his drawings. I just want to show you mm -hmm. 